Welcome to California State University at Monterey Bay's World Theater. Please turn off all electronic devices at this time. Emergency exits are located at the right and left of the theater. In case of emergency, please follow instructions from our staff. Thank you. Mm, yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I can't see you out there. It's really dark, but I'm very pleased to welcome you all to our second event of the President's Speaker Series for the 2012-13 academic year. My name is Kathy Cruzeribe. I'm the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs. Before we start, I have one small housekeeping item. We will have a Q&A session after today's talk. And so in your programs, you should have a card. And you can write your questions on the card as they come up during the talk. And people will be collecting those questions so that uh, we will be able to um, bring them to our speaker after the talk. So please write down your questions on those cards. And you'll be passing them down to the end of the rows throughout the talk as, as he is speaking. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our president, Dr. Eduardo Ochoa. Dr. Ochoa Bring has been at Cal State Monterey Bay since July of 2012, and he brings an impressive array of personal, academic, and professional experience to our campus, including experience at four different CSUs in addition to CSU Monterey Bay, as well as a recent stint as the Assistant Secretary for Post-Secondary Education in the Department of Education in Washington, D.C. Dr. Ochoa is very interested in innovation, hence the theme for our speaker series this year. And so without further ado, please welcome Dr. President Eduardo Ochoa. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Cal State Monterey Bay. Um, I'm very pleased to kind of see you out there. Um, uh, we have today uh, a very uh, special guest, uh, Dr. Sebastian Thrun, uh, who has uh, really been uh, making the headlines lately. Uh, but before I turn to his introduction, let me just uh, set a little bit of context here. Uh, we have uh, a situation in, in our country where we need to dramatically expand uh, the number of students uh, who go to college and graduate. Uh, this has been a call that's been put out by President Obama and his uh, challenging uh, education goal for the year 2020 for the United States to become once again the most educated nation in the world. Uh, as I uh, went to Washington before this job, um, as Assistant Secretary for Post-Secondary Education, I was very concerned that the President's goal was in direct collision with the trends uh, impacting uh, state funding for higher education by all of the states uh, across our country. And so uh, it was clear to me that we were going to have to uh, expand substantially the productivity and efficiency of our higher education system. And we really are at a, a propitious time to do that. Uh, we have had a number of developments in terms of uh, technology, in terms of advances in uh, learning science and brain research that I think for the first time make it really possible for us to kind of revolutionize how we uh, do teaching and learning, to have um, our processes for doing that based on uh, the basic science of human learning and taking advantage of the tremendous expansion of computing power that we have experienced in the past few decades. Uh, to really conceptualize how that process takes place uh, in very different ways than were possible before. And uh, Dr. Thrun uh, has sort of uh, erupted into the, this uh, landscape 
uh, with um, an event that uh, really uh, spread like wildfire in the media and got the attention of all of the uh, uh, major journalistic outlets, uh, as well as the policy makers, both in Washington and Sacramento. And that's when he uh, put a uh, course in artificial intelligence online on a MOOC, and uh, uh, exceeding all expectations, he uh, ended up with 160,000 students enrolling from across the globe. And so ever since then, there's been quite a bit of um, um, turbulence in higher education. In fact, uh, I would say that there is a, a real link between that event and uh, a, a little sort of um, minor crisis that occurred uh, in one of our um, hallowed institutions, uh, the University of Virginia, where uh, the board there became so concerned about uh, being left behind on this uh, train that was leaving the station, uh, or so they thought, that they briefly fired their president. Uh, only to have uh, um, an outcry from both the, um, the campus and the alumni community, which ended up bringing the president back. But uh, it just sort of was symptomatic of the, the anxiety that's being felt there by many institutions. So um, this is uh, the kind of the environment that this is, is happening in. Well, we, um, we, we th we, we're very lucky to have Dr. Sebastian Thurn come and uh, share with us his experience, uh, not only in that, but what he went on to do after that, which is to found, uh, co-found Udacity, one of the three major uh, MOOC providers now that are uh, really the topic of conversation everywhere in higher education. When I was uh, in Washington for the American Council on Education meetings, uh, this was a big topic uh, as well. And. Um, Actually, uh, we are also fortunate um, in that uh, the CSU has also gotten engaged with this process in a way that, in fact, may be most, uh, um, most far-seeing and propitious, I think. Uh, a lot of the, the, um, the buzz in, uh, in the media is about elite universities putting their courses online with uh, two other uh, enterprises, uh, Coursera and edX. And uh, the idea there is that um, somehow now students would have access to uh, top flight courses from these uh, elite institutions, Ivy League institutions and so forth. But uh, what, uh, unlike those, the other two, uh, Udacity under the leadership of uh, Dr. Thrun has actually engaged with uh, the California State University system and generally the state of California and in dialogues with Governor Brown to really address a much more fundamental challenge, which is the challenge of expanding capacity for higher education. And uh, about 78% of all college graduates go through public higher education institutions, not the uh, elite Ivy League schools that so preoccupy uh, our journalist pundits. Um, so, um, so it was very, uh, thrilling to see that uh, Udacity has partnered with San Jose State to actually uh, use MOOCs to address uh, the issue of uh, student readiness for college um, and the challenge of providing uh, developmental courses uh, in math and, and ultimately in other subjects as well. So uh, this is really, um, uh, I think has a potential to be a true game changer for higher education in the United States. So I'm very interested to hear how that's working out. Uh, Sebastian Thrun is, uh, is uh, also, an, I mean, you know, he became well known to the general media because of this development, but um, he's also uh, a, a, a very uh, remarkable scholar even before this. He has published uh, over 370 scientific papers and 11 books, and he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering in the United States. He's also the recipient of the 2012 Smithsonian Ingenuity Award. And in 2011, he received the Max Planck Research Award and was named Fast Company Magazine's uh, fifth most, most creative per, uh, person in business in the world. And he's a native of Germany with degrees from the University of Hildesheim and the University of Bonn. And we're really delighted that he could join us here today and look forward to hearing what he has to say. Dr. Sebastian Thrun. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much. Um, it's a great pleasure being here. And thanks for taking the afternoon. to attend um, my talk. Um, first of all, um, I want to express uh, my uh, apologies if you followed the media and learned about MOOCs and uh, felt that we are on shaking grounds. That was never my intention. Um, my intention is really to help and assist. Uh, but I also want to um, express my appreciation for what you and faculty are actually doing here um, in the CSU system in, in, in Monterey Bay. Um, it's great to see so much dedication among all of you uh, to really help the youth of this country to become more powerful and more successful. And that's exactly what I, as a lifelong educator, have dedicated my life to as well. Now, paths of life are somewhat mysterious, and things happen that you don't plan for. And that happened to me about a year and a half ago. <clears throat> I attended a conference called TED, where a young fellow named Salman Khan gave a talk. I see some of you have uh, crossed that name before. Sal is one of my heroes. Um, he, um, at the time when his work started six years ago, um, was a hedge fund uh, anal analyst uh, and had nothing to do with education, except he had two nieces. And those two nieces, he taught math. And at some point, when he was traveling and trying to explain them a concept, he realized he wouldn't be able to be there in time and instead uh, recorded himself on YouTube so that the nieces could watch his explanation on YouTube. And two things changed that happened that changed his life. Number one, the nieces told him they actually preferred him on YouTube over him in person. <laughs> and the reason was they could find him and see him and watch him again. And you know what, watch him in their underpants in the privacy of the bedroom. It's a big deal. And secondly, it wasn't just his two nieces that started watching him, but at the time he gave his TED talk, tens of millions of other students who liked the explanations. And that led to possibly the most important revolution in K-12 to the state. I would think of Sal Khan as the single most influential educator that we have right now in this country. That's quite remarkable for someone who doesn't have a PhD in education or never wanted to be an educator. Some of these stories, I think, of uh, American ingenuity uh, where different thinking, different background, all of a sudden, and an ounce of good luck and surprise lead to solutions that no one ever anticipated. And Sal has been, of course, tirelessly uh, innovating since, proving that C-level math students can make it to A-level if they're just given the opportunity to progress at their own speed. Now, I heard this in the audience and at the time, I was teaching at Stanford. And I had a fairly successful class. Uh, it was a graduate level class on artificial intelligence. And typically, 200 students would enroll, which by Stanford standards is a large number. And here was this guy, a hedge fund analyst, who would get 20 million students. So I felt I had to do something about my own class. So Peter Norvig and I, Peter is my good friend and buddy, a Google engineer. Uh, who teaches class together, got together and decided, let's put this class online. And we had no clue what that meant at the time. But to test the waters, we sent one email, and I'll show you the email. This is the entire email. In fact, this is my entire marketing campaign for my artificial intelligence class. And you shouldn't read it all. I'm going to just highlight one sentence for you. Um, we, we told people it's free, it's online, you can sign up. We got a domain name, aiclass.org. And we give you the same exams and exercises as Stanford students, so you can compare yourself to Stanford students. Now, <laughs> Peter and I took bets uh, how many students we would get. Uh, and, and Peter would say 2,000, 3,000. And I was the outlier. I said 10,000 students. And I mean, at that time, there weren't classes that had 10,000 students. I mean, today it feels like completely natural and normal and just 10,000. But at the time, that didn't exist. So people looked at me and said, Sebastian, dream on. Now, that was on a Friday afternoon. Saturday morning when I woke up, there were 5,000 students sign up. Sunday morning, 10,000 students. Monday morning, when we were all over the blogosphere, how great Stanford was finally opening up 
its sacred halls to the public, we had 14,000 students, which is when the administration figured out what I just done. <laughs> I didn't expect anything like that. And I got a phone call from my dean saying, Sebastian. <laughs> I said, Dean. <laughs> So after a whole bunch of meetings, uh, we agreed to continue <coughs> and, and offer this class free of charge to the world. And two other Stanford faculty, Andrew Wing and Jennifer Widom, decided to also put their classes online that they had previously prepared uh, for more like a, a close uh, classroom use. Now, I was facing a problem. At the time, I was a Google VP, Stanford research professor, teaching my classes. I had basically two full-time jobs, and I had no technology, and I had to teach a class to 160,000 students. So obviously there was something missing. So, so we had to scramble together a technology platform within a few weeks and make a class that we could teach to 160,000 students. Uh, and, and, and if you're ever nervous about going to class because there's too many students, 160,000 is a large number. So <laughs> it's a very high embarrassment factor. So Peter and I, here's Peter and me, uh, scrambled uh, in our basement and his house and my house to put together this class. And there was one thing that I really wanted to do differently and we do differently today and later I'll demonstrate to you so you can see the effect of it, um, is that I just never was inspired by the way online classes are built. <laughs> what we do in a classroom is uh, very different from what we can do online. In a classroom, we're forced to go at a, a fixed speed with our students. And if I pictured a stadium of 160,000 students, God forbid a stadium the size doesn't even exist, uh, then the best I could do is just shout out my lecture. But I, I never felt there was the right way to learn. So what we decided to do is rather than recording our lectures, we recorded our exercises and made the class entirely around exercise and student experience. So here's a typical example in the middle of a class. This was literally done uh, on a piece of paper, on a napkin, with a pen and a camcorder that my wife had given me for my birthday on a tripod. That's the origin of, of the MOOCs. Um, and in this class, um, I, I really introduced concepts by question after question after question. This is a fairly evolved mathematical logics concept out of base networks, which most of you will probably have no clue what it's talking about. You can take my class if you want to, if you care. But the key thing is we, we extended the video format from a, a pure a passive viewing experience to one where the student gets engaged and has to answer questions. So the video screen that would explain the question would stop, freeze, and become have the, either little push buttons or numerical questions or textual questions. And then students would be able to, to venture their guesses. And then the system would give feedback. Um, whether these uh, things are right or wrong. And then I would come as the, to, to students' rescue and explain to them how I would solve the problem. So always student exercise first. Uh, we scrambled this together. Most of the recording occurred between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. Um, most of my students in the huge discussion forum uh, could tell how fatigued I was and how tired I looked. Um, a lot of my headshots were taken on a mattress as opposed to in a studio, uh, <laughs> which they couldn't tell. My perspective doesn't really work in video very well. Um, but we, we, we scratched it together and we made a full-blown uh, class um, uh, throughout the semester. The things that moved me were actually not the numbers. 160,000 sounds like a shockingly large number for any professor, but it's small compared to the world population. What really moved me the most were the testimonies and emails we received. So here's one, and I want to read um, uh, <coughs> a piece of you. And I got literally thousands of, of such emails. This is a, a fellow trooper, a soldier in Afghanistan, who sends me, uh, I'm completing the course from remote areas of Afghanistan and often don't have uh, great internet connectivity or electricity. I spent the last few days under incoming mortar and rocket attacks, then dodging que checkpoints under questionable legal status to exfiltrate a war zone to a third world airfield until things settled down. I had about an hour of fairly solid internet connectivity to be able to get the assignments done and still <laughs> manage a respectable score. <laughs> this is a typical week here for me. That isn't your typical Stanford student. <laughs> That's one of our troops putting their lives online every day for us and trying to develop a future past the battlefield. It was obvious to me the impact I was having on this one student 
with entire hopes were centered now around my class to the point that he would expose himself to extra life risk to get the assignments done in time and manage a respectable score, that impact was much higher than the impact I have on the typical Stanford student. I actually often told my students at Stanford when they worry about what career to go into, what job to pick, I'd always tell them, don't worry about it, uh, the job will find you. Little did I understand that that job would find me through these emails. Here's a second example um, of a lady named Sabrina um, who worked 40 plus hours a week. She was a single mother of two and a younger child only seven months old. I have no time to concentrate or dedicate. Uh, I, I've still been hanging onto the class by my fingernails, wanting to learn and to feel a sense of accomplishment. Just before homework five was due, I suffered another series of great chaotic difficulties in my life. My job has been threatened by the economic climate. My personal life kind of exploded. I'm on my own with the children. The baby has been sick. A family member is suddenly sick. Another losing their home. The list goes on and on. Why am I telling you so much personal stuff? Because on number 13, I gave up. And she goes more text. And then on Monday morning, this is great out here, uh, I checked my email and I saw the note you sent Saturday. And I stared at it for a while, and then I sighed and told to myself, I can't quit now. I took the midterm this weekend, mostly while holding a teething infant. None of my other uh, issues have gone away, but I feel more determined than ever to see this through for myself, because I want to, because it makes me feel good. Again, not your typical Stanford student. There's so many mothers and so many parents that went off the education and job path to raise children and coming to a point in their life where they ask the question, what's their self-value, what's their future? Here was able to touch somebody who would never get admitted into Stanford. This is very, very powerful to get emails like those. Now this specific email I got because um, as the um, homeworks came along, I think it was about homework five, about uh, 40,000 students had fallen behind. So I sent 40,000 personal emails to people that said, you're falling behind. One was to Sabrina. And I got maybe 8,000 replies back, most of which I wasn't able to read. Uh, they would tell me why they had fallen behind and what the resolution was. But I would make it a habit to read at least 50 or so every day. And many of these emails that I read had the same theme to it. Another set of emails um, really addressed shortcomings that we had. Um, I had set up the uh, course very much like a typical Stanford course. You got a one-time chance your exam, and if you don't get it right, we just give you a bad grade. Lots, thousands of students complained and said, why on earth in the online age would you want to give us a bad grade? Why not just give us extra time and extra chances to finally get it right? And then there was a set of emails that really blew my mind. Students saying, this is the most intimate learning experience of my life. And I didn't get that this was possible. I always thought, if you're in a classroom of many students, how can this be intimate? 100, 200, 160,000. Mm -hmm. But the truth was, the student experience was not dissimilar from the way experience a good movie or a video game. It didn't bother you that there were 160,000 other students watching it at, at about the same time. It would go at your own pace and would speak to you. You'd feel right next to me. There's a magic in this medium that I didn't expect existed, but it really changed students' lives. So we got thousands and thousands of students who said, best class ever in my life. Now that all made me believe, wow, there's something in here. We have to really dive deeper and see whether we can really make a difference <laughs> in the way we educate students. And I went on a journey. Um, I um, famously, about a year and a half ago, a year ago, um, uh, told the public that it'd be hard for me to go back and teach just 160 students. Uh, and I felt uh, in the world of education, um, there's a choice to take a red pill or a blue pill. Uh, and, and, and you can take the blue pill and go back to your regular classroom. But I've taken the red pill, and I, I want to see how deep rabbit hole it is. And I've, I've been in this process. The statistics of this class are really staggering. Um, and this was just the first of our classes. We have since had much better classes. 160,000 students, 23,000 of them graduated. 
1,950 people volunteered to translate this class into 44 languages. Students from 195 countries took this close. We had more students in Lithuania than Stanford has students. When we finally stacked ranked all the students and looked at the comparison of the best Stanford students versus the best online students, the top 412 students were all online. And number 413 was the leading Stanford student. And the last number on this slide, 0.6, is the one that has really captured the media's attention, and I think sadly has captured the media's attention. That's the dollar amount per student that we had to pay for everything, including platform development and making the course. So it was less than a dollar per student. Now, let me step back a little bit and give you some um, perspective on um, education that is on many, many people's minds, especially if you're a student right now, it's probably on your mind. In the last 30 years, we had a sustained growth of college costs, tuition costs, educational expenses. Uh, the growth rate has been about 7.45% per year on average, outpacing every other field, including medical, housing, and of course, inflation. Um, we've gotten to the point where the national debt in college tuition is a trillion dollars. And that debt uh, is unforgivable. If you have college debt, you won't be able to go through bankruptcy and get rid of it. This puts an unbelievable burden on the young generation. We are at the first time moving into a generation where the kids are less college educated than their parents on average. That's something we should really uh, keep in mind because I think we are on a path where the benefits of college education are being questioned and we're getting to a point, an inflection point, where the confidence of students to go to college might actually be shaken. It's actually happening right now. And as a result, uh, we might find uh, that this might end up be feel like a bubble that bursts. I'm not saying this because I want to um, make everybody feel bad in education. I'm saying this because this is actually a fact, <laughs> whether we like it or not. And now is a really great time to constructively think about how can we actually really help and avoid uh, that at some point our higher education system will have a, a major setback. Um, the company that I founded is called Udacity. We're one of the big three um, in, or big, we're all small, I guess, in, 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 in these massive open online courses or MOOCs. Uh, we have right now about 22 courses online, several with the CSU, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we have about 1.2 million students in total. We have a whole bunch of com partner companies. Those companies like Google and NVIDIA and Microsoft fund class development, but they also recruit some of our graduates, and uh, we have about 45 people. Um, our mission uh, at this point is twofold. Uh, we really care about uh, driving pedagogy. Uh, this is the number one thing we care about, inventing a framework in online that really makes it possible to educate effectively, and that's the number one thing I care about at this point. Um, I, I wouldn't claim that our official, original class did a great job with this. We, we can do much, much better. And also really th rethink the cost of education and ask the question as we go to scale, is there a path in there in which we can reach many more people, enhance access, and then also make this access available, uh, uh, the savings available back to the students, which is what we're doing with San Jose State. In pedagogy, and I'll give you a demonstration in a second, um, we take our motivation from fields of learning that might not be uh, respectable among traditional educators, but I believe are really important to pay attention to, most notably video games. Let me take a show of hand. Who here knows what video game this is? Thank you. Pretty much everybody. Who here has played it? Who has played it for more than 10 hours? <laughs> That's the embarrassment factor. I see hands go up and down very quickly. <laughs> Interesting. I, I bet more than I just saw hands. <laughs> um, video games are really interesting animals. Um, in that they teach you something. Angry Bird teaches you about how birds in slingshots affect blocks and pigs. <laughs> not, not exactly PhD material at Stanford, but there's a notion of physics in there, there's a notion of problem solving, there's a notion of skill. Now Angry Birds is not your classical lecture environment, it's very different. No one ever lectures you. You learn by doing. 
with a curated sequence of problems. But assessment, which we tend to dislike as a student in higher education, is your friend in Angry Birds. In fact, you crave to make it to the next level. You crave so much that at least one person for about a second admitted to have played more than 10 hours Angry Birds. Even though you won't get college credit for Angry Birds. Now, why is, is that an interesting thing to look at? I'm not saying that Angry Birds is the solution for a higher education problem, not far removed. But drawing inspirations from fields that are counter to what we do today is always a good thing and, and, and seeing if we can bring it in. In Angry Birds, your assessments are extremely frequent. You have as much time as you want. You can try as often as you want. And when you finally get it, you've really acquired the skill and you get a certain sense of pride. It almost acts like a drug. That's why people get sucked into video games to go to the next level. What a beautiful learning method. If only we could design Angry Birds to get you all the way to a PhD in physics, then we had a fantastic uh, <coughs> approach to higher education. In Angry Birds, people want to learn. If you do video games, you want to learn. It turns out people do want to learn. It's a myth that students don't want to learn. So I want to give you a demonstration um, of how we take these inspirations into um, Udacity. And of course, we're not anywhere near as, as good in Angry Birds, but we are much more academic. We, we do classes that are really advanced all the way to, to upper level master's degree classes, and of course, also entry level classes. And the demo I want to give you is, I want to actually really expose you to a typical Udacity class. And I don't want to just have you take the class. I also want you to uh, see the making of the class. So let's see if this works. I'm going to unplug this for a second. Um, so here's my Udacity course creator. And um, maybe I'll start with a little video. Um, oops, wrong camera, let's see. Um, let's again. Oh. Hi, I'm your professor. Good seeing you. <laughs> All right, nothing, no, nothing really happened. Okay, that's great video. We use it. Okay, call it me. And now I want to go in and make a new lesson. And, um, and rather than teaching you something by um, lecturing you, I want you to experience problem solving. So I'm going to take a physics example. Um, so let's, let's call this, oops, hold on. So this is my class on Physics 101. And I'm making this right now as you listen, okay? And I'm going to start with a little problem for you. You are on a lake. inside a boat. Let's make this the water here. Perfect. Maybe there's a fish in here, I don't know. <laughs> okay. And inside the boat is a heavy, heavy rock. So it's a rock. And now I'm going to take this rock and toss it over. Let's do this. You now take this rock and toss it overboard, and the rock, let's take it out, sorry. On this. Sinks straight to the ground. Okay, that's the story. It's a physics thing. Anybody here teaches physics? Ha, good. Awesome, you're gonna get it right. Oops. This again, thinner. So my question for you is, by doing so, has the water level relative to the shore gone up, stayed the same, or gone down? So this is something not the most 
pretty class I've ever made in my life, but it's live, and so let me just show you what I just did. Hold on. Um, to plug this in. So this is my class on Physics 101. You are on a lake inside a boat. And inside the boat is a heavy, heavy rock. You now take this rock and toss it overboard, and the rock sinks straight to the ground. So my question for you is, by doing so, has the water level relative to the shore gone up, stayed the same, or gone down? So water level, obviously I didn't speak very well. So that's kind of making of one of those, so really easy to make. And then I can turn them into quizzes. So let's make a question here. Uh, and this is going to be just a multiple choice. You either went up, stayed the same, or went down. So you can drag those guys. They can also drag other stuff there all the way to program code. But before I, um, before I answer this, let me just ask you, okay, so you had this chance to think about this now. Has the water level, by dropping this heavy stone that goes all the way to the bottom, has the water level gone up, stayed the same, or gone down? Just to see, take a show of hands here. Who thinks it's gone up? About six, seven people, eight people, nine people. Uh, stayed the same. A vast majority. Gone down. About 12 people or so, is that correct? So what do the physics professors think? Gone down. Okay. Um, anyone change your mind right now at this point? <laughs> Professor has spoken. Okay. Um, let me just, um, before I give you the answer, explain to you what just happened. If I'm not mistaken, when you started thinking about this, you were being asked what the right answer is. Your brain's engaged. Your brain's probably worked harder for the last 50 seconds than they worked through the rest of the talk. <laughs> That's what we're after, brain work. We think we can't lose exercise, we well, can't lose weight by watching another person exercise. I think you can't learn by watching another person solve problems. It's not entirely black and white, but by and large, we learn by, by solving problems ourselves. And this medium affords you this because you can take the time to do the right thing. Second thing I want to illustrate is there's a good number of you who didn't raise their hands at all. Why is that? Well, in a big auditorium, it's very embarrassing to be wrong. In fact, when I ask the question, who does Angry Bird for more than 10 hours? I'm sure a good number of you have done this. <laughs> it's like asking the drunk driving question, right? Or do you have a secret uh, girlfriend, boyfriend question? If you don't raise their hands. Um, it turns out uh, learning is also a private matter, and we, 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 we detest to be embarrassed in front of others showing we get it wrong, we don't know the right thing. Um, and it's very common that people don't raise their hand at all just because they're too afraid of being embarrassed, and we know this from students in the class. Whereas in this private medium, it's perfectly fine to be wrong, no one knows. So there's a lot of things you can do online um, that, that, that you could not really do in a classroom very well, and that this medium captures. Um, let's see, let me just take another show of hands. Who says has gone up? Okay, about, still about eight, nine people. Uh, say, say the same. Okay, fewer, gone down. Um, I see, so a little bit more. So the, the authority of a physics professor clearly adds to the solution. Um, now I could make the next unit, uh, by which I would then show you um, that when you take a bucket of water, and um, you add a rock to this bucket, the volume goes up, um, but only in proportion to the um, volume of the rock. But if I go and, um, oops, do the same with the vessel inside, like this one, then this rock doesn't just displace its volume, because it's a heavy rock, it also replaces additional air. Oop, sorry, I'm not good at speaking and drawing at the same time. Additional air, which is the area over here, related to its weight. And since it's a rock that is very heavy, it ends up replacing more. So it means before the rock was, in, when the rock was in the boat, the water level must have been higher than after it sank to the ground. And the physics professor was correct. Congratulations. Then it's actually really good, I think. Um, so when you dive in and look at uh, the classes, 
Uh, we have uh, 22 or so online. Uh, we're not the biggest, but we put a lot of work into the pedagogy. Um, if I take a random one, this is statistics um, that's being taught with, by two San Jose State um, professors. And um, <coughs> let's see if we get in here. They're the professors. Um, this is a. Um, here's Ron teaching this class. Welcome to Statistics, the Science of Decisions. But before we get started with the class, Sean, Katie, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what our expectations are for you and what you so should expect to So they go into like, regular, um, like random points, and I have, and I have no clue what I'm going to here. Obviously, I haven't really taken the class. Say Lesson 5, whatever Lesson 5 is. Uh, what you find is, um, okay, cake will be served, I see. We have a latency problem specifically here right now. Um, you'd see that the, this is on the top, the top bar is the class, the orange dot, and each of these little dots is a quiz. So here's a typical thing. What about for Andy? How many standard deviations is Andy's number of Twitter followers below the mean number of Twitter followers? <laughs> so we take problems that kids can relate to, like Twitter followers, and then um, we have these quizzes and these quizzes are usually very hard. Um, some of them are textual, some of them are numerical, some of them are full mathematical expressions, some are theorems, um, some are program code. And I can submit my answer and get uh, feedback. Sometimes the feedback is binary, you got it wrong. Often it's actually qualified where you get some, some more hints. Um, in basic math, let's see if I can find my basic math classes again, course catalog. Um, Here's college algebra, one of our classes, which is the um, GE algebra class, I guess. Uh, math 8, it's called. It's kind of slow. Um, we have like hundreds of quizzes, and the entire evolution of the material focuses around those quizzes. So if I take this class um, with Julie, who's a fantastic San Jose State uh, professor, really great, um, you can go in and wait. And if you look at the top bar, you can barely, you probably can't see it. Um, there's quiz after quiz after quiz after quiz after quiz. Let me just pick a random one. Slow X and Y intercept. I have no clue what that is. But when I get there, there's typically a short test. Um, Which type there. of lines or types of lines cannot be ah. written in this form we've just been talking about? Y equals MX. Plus. And often students skip stay to the quiz and do the quiz first. And when they've got the quiz wrong or right or wrong, they go and, and rewatch the instruction, and then they t finally get it right. Um, so that's kind of a flair of it. Um, what I haven't really shown you is um, that some of our quizzes are really engaged. This is uh, from our computer science classes, where the quiz is writing program code. And some of the code is really complicated. We have a computer science class that had more than 260,000 students. And it's a class, Introduction to Computer Science, by David Evans from the University of Virginia. And in this class, um, the instructor <coughs> gets you from no programming whatsoever to program your own search engine, so you can build your own little Google. Uh, we feel it's important to put stuff into context, um, to give motivation that people care about. Building your own Google appeals to a certain number of people, more than data structures and algorithms. Um, so we figured uh, we, we focus on problems that people really care about. We have a, a physics class where the first assignment or the first lecture or first unit is about measuring the circumference of the planet uh, using a ruler and a clock. It turns out the Greeks did do this. They figured out it's round. The Catholics and the, the, the Christians forgot it for a few hundred years, but for a while it was known. And, um, and it turns out if you take <laughs> basic trigonometry and, and, and sine and cosine, the bits of math and a ruler and a clock, you can measure how big the planet is. And students all around the world get into this frenzy of measuring how big the planet is. Some travel to Ecuador to the equator and took measurements there and exchanged those, those things. And there was this big mass movement of students really trying to explore how big the, the, the planet is. And as, as a side effect, they learn all about trigonometry and, and geometry and, and, and basic laws in the space. But they were highly motivated to do so. Now, that pedagogy is what we're trying to explore and what we're really after because we believe that if we get the pedagogy right in this medium, we can really change the world and really bring learning to students that otherwise uh, might be lost in the classroom. Um, this is a Time Magazine cover that focused on us and actually evaluated a whole bunch of MOOCs and picked ours as the one they liked the best. So the entire cover story in October last year was about us. 
And Amanda Ripley, who wrote it, um, at some point writes, what surprised me uh, was the way the class was taught. It was designed according to how the brain actually learns. In other words, it had almost nothing in common with most classes I'd taken before. And this is not to, to kind of blame um, what we do in classrooms. In classrooms, we are forced to be synchronous. And by being forced to be synchronous, one instructor many students, our repertoire is limited. And if you were able to afford a single professor per student, I think we could actually do better. In fact, shown so by Benjamin Bloom in the 1980s in a famous paper called The Two Sigma Effect. But we can't afford doing it in the classroom. But in this online medium, there's a chance to go and revisit all this and make uh, using the asynchronicity of online uh, as a driving factor in, in coming up with very new pedagogies. And that's what I'm very excited about. Now, with San Jose State, we have a, a fantastic collaboration that started about half a year ago. Um, we got all kinds of stakeholders together and asked the question, how can we use this new instrument, the MOOC? How can we evolve it further? <laughs> but also, how can we bring it uh, to the best benefit of the state of California? And this was all based on a phone call I received uh, June 18th last year by Governor Brown, who out of the blue called me up and said, hey, I'm your governor. And I said, I am your citizen. <laughs> and, and he said, look, we have a crisis in California. And I said, what? Um, he said, my response was like too much taxes. Of course we have a crisis. But, but he said, no, 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 no. Um, we have over 470,000 students waitlisted that can't get in. We have an escalation of tuition costs. We have enormous retake rates. I think in the CSU system, about one CSU dedicated just to retakes, if you work out the math. Um, we have um, just, um, I mean, a four-year degree takes six years. Uh, I read this article about you. Can you help us? And I said, of course I can. And, and then the next months of my life were dedicated to finding out how to help. And I, I talked to pretty much everybody. I talked to the CSU community colleges. I talked to the unions. I talked to uh, all kinds of stakeholders. We asked the creditors, the, the, the state government, various foundations. And we put together this plan to try out uh, to bring this, this instrument of this massive online class to the benefit of California students. And rather than phrasing it as a competition to existing college, which I think is a really bad way to look at this. We looked at this as a way to enhance access. And who better uh, to reach out to than high school students who generally come relatively unprepared to college? When you look at the rate of high school students who get stuck in remedial in the CSU system, it's close to 60%. So more than half of the students don't even get the benefits to enjoy college when they come here, but instead have to do remedial work, usually mathematics or English. Uh, so a question arose, can we help those students to get college ready? And can we, can, we, can we give students a taste of college? Can we bring the equivalent of AP classes to high schools that can't even afford AP classes, like inner city classes? The governor had started a school called Oakland Military Institute, mostly black kids. Can we give those kids the same education that the super rich kids get at a super rich private high school by using this new medium? So we started with three classes. We now have five, um, most in mathematics and statistics. And, um, and try to, to bring them to those students. And to make sure that it's not just something for the super rich, we, uh, we used the fact that we had certain savings and, and, and made the classes cheaper than the typical yard in the CSU. We offering them for 150 bucks. And Belinda, Bill and Melinda Gates came in and, and, and just paid all these $150 bills for all of our kids in the, in the system, so it meant to be free. Uh, but we also said, well, rather than just making it a one free computer program, uh, let's toss in uh, human supervision and human mentoring. Uh, we had observed that the typical MOOC has a retention rate of about 3 to 5 percent, and we wanted to have a retention rate of 100 percent. Um, so we ended up uh, designing a fleet of tutors and, and mentors and, and others that sit there and work with students, help them through the program, and also available as a 24-7 helpline with those students, which is ongoing right now. So if you're one of those students, you will enjoy the benefits of this. And I can't really talk too much about results. There's a big discussion going on. Um, the National Science Foundation is doing a study. But we have some very, very good data points. And one that we publicly discussed is in our statistics class, um, we were able to bring the retention rate up to 100% uh, uh, from 3.4% in the open MOOC by providing services around it. So part of this is for us to really find a model that we can bring out of the college to students who are, are not inside college and, and have them benefit from it. And in this specific case, accrue college credit. So when they hit college, they're done faster, they're more educated, and as a result, the CSU system should be able to graduate more students in total without increasing costs. And that's kind of great for the state of California, given that we vastly underserving our student population. We turn away many, many students, and many students go to neighboring states 
and study there because we have insufficient capacity. Now, one might take issue with this and say, well, if we just gave more money and fund our system better, we could educate all those students. But that's something that's way above my pay grade, where all these politics come in about like how much money is available and who should be given to, should be the prisons or the schools and so on. So I, I take no position there. But we certainly uh, are inspired to help with technology and new teaching approaches to see if we can really help high school students to be more prepared. Now, I want to close my presentation before the, the, the QA session with some prediction about 2020. And 2020 is far enough out that we hopefully won't be bothered too much by it. But I have some aspirations about how education should tra be transformed. And these are much more, more global and fundamental observations. Here's my first one. Um, the organization of life. Um, from the good old days, pre-industrial revolution, we've learned that the first five years of life are dedicated to play. Actually, I guess childhood is a more recent innovation. Uh, but then there's, uh, today at least, a long phase of education all the way to age maybe 24. If you get a PhD, maybe age 48. Uh, and, and then there's a phase of work, and then there's a phase of rest followed by death. And, and that model is, is prevalent in higher education. That is, when we take students into higher education, we tend, there's not a time to for all your students, but many students, we tend to take them in full time. And then, most importantly, when we're done with them, we give them a degree. And at elite institutions, the handshake that used to be like this changes something like this. <laughs> that, to me, is just exactly the wrong model for the 21st century. And we ought to change this. And this is going to have profound impacts on everything in higher education. Here's the correct model. And you can debate how thick these bars should be. Obviously, a, a three-year-old shouldn't be working in a, on a conveyor belt. Um, but I think play, educate, work, and rest should all be interleaved and interwoven. And specifically, educate is a lifelong endeavor, and not just a uh, fixed-time endeavor. Uh, educational companies, uh, also known as universities, should be available uh, to support us to our lifetime needs. It turns out every other industry does this already. So my cable company, my HMO, uh, all of those support me through my entire life, except for my educational company, also known as university, which says, when you're done, goodbye. We have no service for you as you go through life. The reason why I think this is really important is um, hundreds of years ago, we lived in a world where between the time you were born and the time you died, almost nothing really changed. Now we live in a world where everything changes all the time. So hundreds of years ago, having a single phase of education was probably sufficient. Today it isn't. In my old field of computer science, almost everything that is important today did not exist 10 years ago. And if you're a computer scientist, you know about this. It's probably true for your field as well. Uh, we didn't have mobile computing. We didn't have cloud services. We didn't have programming languages like Ajax and Ruby on Rails and what the names are. None of this stuff existed. Um, and yet we still under the illusion that a one-time education is the right solution for everybody. So what this medium will afford us, I think, is making education much more accessible if we can reach out to continuing education. In fact, we have a huge number of classes on our website right now built by companies that seem to want to bestow kids um, and, and people of all ages with the type skills needed for the workforce. One example is Google has a class out on HTML5. HTML5 is the language by which you program your web browsers. Big deal. There's almost nothing in the industry you can do without HTML5. In fact, it's going to be the de facto standards for phones as well. So it's a huge, huge, huge labor opportunity, and almost no college teaches it. And even if colleges do teach it, if you've left college, you won't be able to get access to it. So we're making it available. We have over 58,000 students in this class right now, many in India, many in the United States. We can really close the gap. And this is an academic class. It's not just a, a skills class. It's about game design in, in a programming language. It's as good as most computer science classes. NVIDIA has a class on parallel programming using modern uh, tools. Most parallel programming classes that I know of are very outdated and use tools that don't even exist anymore. Um, so, so with this medium, we can really address this, in my opinion. Um, there's many other things, I think, that will change um, and have to change, and we should really think about this. And they don't have to change tomorrow morning, but I think they're important mm -hmm. because they really reflect developments in society we can't ignore. Or if we ignore them, we'll be less and less relevant. Uh, one is semester-long classes. Uh, the, the old format of semester made perfect sense when you really had to come to a physical campus and sit there with your professor in the same location. Um, much of today's learning doesn't take a semester, it takes one evening. When you go out and try to learn something, you typically don't enroll in a class, you go to Google and just learn it. 
Okay, so we have to shorten the unit uh, massively and give students more control of which units to pick and have a faster finishing time. It's almost as profound as the transition from like long letters to Twitter, which is really profound in my opinion. Um, in the past, only professors could teach. I think everybody should be able to teach. Uh, the best students uh, are the ones that teach, and the best way to learn the material is to teach it. When I say witchcraft to data-driven teaching, witchcraft might be the wrong word, but a lot of what I learned as an instructor was how to teach was based on rumors and observing my own professors teach. I would never had an instrument that helped me understand how good my teaching really is. And I can tell you when I, um, I looked at the scores of my um, Stanford students after AI class, and saw them go up when I gave the online version relative to my in-class version, I was shocked that my regular classroom teaching wasn't as effective as what Salman Khan was effectively doing. Um, this new medium will afford us to get instant data on our teaching performance and help us improve our teaching materials, not based on rumors or discussions, but just based on statistics, which I think is exactly the right way to go. If you doubt it, um, most modern companies like Netflix and Amazon massively use machine learning to tailor their websites to make your purchase more. We should use the same insights to tailor our educational materials and experiences to make the students learn more and better. Proactive learning versus just in time learning. Um, a lot of learning that takes place today is, is proactive. We educate people very young in the hopes that this, the skills and knowledge might be needed later on. Uh, the world is changing to just in time, and the reason is information materials are becoming more accessible. We outsourced the human cultural brain from our physical brains and to the internet. Um, that means we can defer learning when it's more needed, when we are more motivated. I think we as institutions should uh, understand this and really get into this to understand that, that, that a lot of learning takes place when people are highly motivated and needed. An example is I recently had to refinance a house. I'm not a refinance expert, but in no time, thanks to Google, I became a refinancing expert. And it was just in time. If I had taken a class in college on how to refinance a house, I probably would have long forgotten how to do this. And finally, the one size fits all, I think, is a myth that we are undergoing. We are obsessed with uh, grouping people into cohorts based on age in K through 12. And we are obsessed in taking students on the journey at the same speed. What this new medium will give us is an ability to tailor the experience to individual students. Uh, and a good example is Go at Your Own Pace, has already taken place uh, at Udacity and Khan Academy and others. But I think there's much more to it. Uh, I envision a medium that is smart enough to understand that you have a specific type problem in a specific subject area and takes you on a tour through the subject area so you can uh, make up for the remedial work needed in the specific uh, sub area and then bring you back. And that's something that could never happen in a classroom, but it's beautifully done in the online world. As a result, I believe uh, the online world has opportunities that go way beyond what we can do in classrooms. The comparison uh, is certainly not a good comparison to make. I don't think we can compare theater and, and film and ask which one's better, is it theater or film? I think both of them have, have their own strengths. Um, but what I firmly believe is uh, that this kind of education, if you take it seriously, if you're willing to experiment and engage, if you're willing to fail in experiments and get up and try it again, can really change pedagogy, can change access, and ultimately also will change costs uh, for the students. Thank you so much.
now reach more people. And a part of how this question will play out is a uh, factor of a number of things. One is how good a job we can do online. Uh, how quickly will the education system embrace online? I think the safest way to run big business is just not embrace it, in my opinion. And I can give you lots of industry examples where industry funding on this didn't embrace it as a result suffered a serious setback. Um, it's, there's an enormous opportunity uh, to redefine the classroom experience. Uh, I'm a teacher myself, and I, I spend a lot of time on the same stuff over and over again. Uh, like, I give the same lectures every time. So why not do I give the same lectures but just get passion and do more interesting things? I think we can now come back and make the classroom really brilliant by taking away from the other world. We should take that opportunity and make it really brilliant. I'm a firm believer there's a really, really strong need for in-class and in-person interaction and education. Um, so my viewpoint of this is uh, we should use these new technologies at the fullest uh, force that we can do because we want to be innovative, we want to solve problems and, 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 and enhance and just make learning much, much, much better. And as a result, I think you're going to get many more students, not fewer students. You get students of all ages, students in all geographies. And if you succeed with that, in California, as I said, there's 472,000 regular school students. And I talked to various partners, including the CFA and, and governor and so on. What if you could take a six year degree and bring it back to four years? The answer was, that is great because now we can accept more students. And that's the attitude we'd like to take. Mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, another question kind of pertains to the teaching aspect of it. And it's probably prompted by one of, your, one of your last slides there. If anyone can teach, how will teachers be evaluated? What is the figure of the merit? So, I gave you a story about this, and the story is embarrassing for me. When I did my statistics class, um, I was very proud to teach statistics class. And about a month after it online, I saw a review on something called angrymath.org. None of this review. And the person uh, <coughs> called my class shockingly awful. <laughs> And that in itself wasn't a big deal had you not written a seven page detailed analysis <laughs> of every aspect of my class was shocking you all. And I read this very carefully and then I blogged about it and I replied to it and I, I gave my position and said thank you actually. First of all, it's great that you, you're giving me feedback. You don't know, like the feedback. And then I went in and I found a few points where I agreed. Most of the points I disagreed. This is kind of about your choice. But here's the cool thing. The fact that someone from the outside could look at the sample class. There wasn't just secret. It wasn't just this locked up thing we can never look at. All of a sudden, in the middle of a debate, where anybody in the world can look at my classes. And not just this one happened to be a professor, a substitute professor in upstate New York. But anybody, any student can look at this stuff. I think that's just really exciting to me, that we can bring transparency in the education. And we will have a motivation. I have motivation to make my classes much, much better now that we can actually see them. Yeah, I think that it, it's going from the, the, the classroom being a very private space where nobody really can see it no more. And, and in your course, I'm sure you deal with this a lot. Many of the instructors, I'm sure every single instructor in this, in this audience makes make superb classes and, and dedicates their entire life to be amazing. Um, Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> That's so at the institutions where we, 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 we do superb research and, and we crank up many papers mm -hmm. <laughs> and often are conflicted because promotions aren't based on teaching mm -hmm. performance. I think there's actually a, a secrecy around education that is not healthy. Mm -hmm. There's an emphasis on evaluation of colleges that focuses on the number of Nobel laureates over the number of over the value added by education. And I would love to drag this back into the court where we say we assess institutions based on educational impact, not based on research impact. If we did this, the Harvards and the Yales of the world might find themselves very surprised relative to the CSU. Mm -hmm. And I would love to see that data open. And I think one, if, if, if anything we do with this, you're going to get that effect. Because now we will be able to go out and see what the stuff really is and measure how well it's going to perform. This is an interesting question, and I'm very pleased to see someone is saying, I am in junior high, so that's great. I'm glad somebody is here from junior high. It's wonderful. And find that the game of Minecraft is very motivating and educational. Have you considered using it in your course design? I love that comment. That's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you learn the game of Minecraft. It's actually a fantastic thinking tool, as is Sudoku. <laughs> I go to a like, play, and the person next to me does a Sudoku game. They're learning math without credit. 
it without forcing, right? He said, all the people abandoned me, ah, spend the time doing that. Um, I had to uh, look to the mind speaker, and if I, if I had all the resources in the world, all my classes would be as polished as some of these, these video games. Um, what we have done a lot is looking at problems of this type, and then not stopping at solving it, but going into what are the physics underlying, what are the equations governing the dynamics, and can we finally derive a, a principal solution for this class of problems. So a lot of my computer science stuff, uh, our computer science stuff, really starts with an application like this, but it brings it all the way to the level of <coughs> okay, software, okay, let's start programming a solution. And that's when I think we really do the, the link from game playing all the way to, to meaningful higher education. We great if you could do it with Minecraft. In fact, uh, students, uh, I recommend some of our classes, you try them out, I'd love to get your feedback on this, but they, they feel a little bit like playing Minecraft as you get into it, when you're excited about stepping a step beyond Minecraft. So wherever you are out there, <laughs> get on there and try something. <laughs> That's great. Uh, here's another question from a student's perspective. Does Udacity.com have resources for deaf students? Yes, so we are uh, on our way to ADA compliance. Uh, we subtitle all our, our lectures, obviously, so that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's so kind that's of a solved problem. So with death, mm -hmm. it's, it's fine. Uh, the, the, the main problem we right now is to get blind students. Uh, and, and, and this is an open issue right now. Um, we are um, making things screen reader friendly at this point. The, the problem <laughs> here we have is that we often work with diagrams and visual depictions, and those are very hard to be safe. So this might be a partial answer to this next um, question. Somebody is wondering, what are the downsides of this paradigm of learning? Um, oh, that's not a long talk. That I'll probably have to break. <laughs> um, a huge number of downsides. <laughs> and I, I don't want to proclaim we found the answer. Um, certainly there's um, great creative collaborative work where you tell people, like, what they could tell the for Let's make class for to solve the drinking water problem in India. Um, and then students go out a multidisciplinary team and some fly to India and work about a principal solution that's economical, sound engineering background, legally fits in, doesn't wear the patents, understand whether it's males or females applying the solutions, a huge difference in certain other countries. That kind of learning is way beyond what we can do right now. We do projects and students love projects, but that, that's way, way worse. Then other aspects of college are uncovered, right? So uh, our students don't go out drinking together and partying together and won't find necessarily life mates in our classes that they find them in college. So there's an entire developmental phase that these classes don't even cover. Um, I think we should, um, I mean, I really, I really see them as different. I really ask them the question like, what's different from radio and television, right? Television succeeded radio, but radio hasn't gone away. In fact, there's places where radio is much better than television, like when I'm driving a car. Um, or, I don't know, theater versus Driving that car that doesn't need a driver. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that for us, the more important question right now is, of course, to, to develop um, is, is being better. But also find a way niche where it fits in and really adds value. And don't pretend you're competing with college classes, not the case. Uh, you actually complement college classes. So that might be um, the same person had a, a sub question there. Can you see MOOCs as addressing? some of the social and environmental challenges we face as a society. I mean, I certainly believe that um, the number of resources that we face, or resource problems we face in society today has nothing to do with, with global warming or water shortage, and all it's to do with human capital. I mm. think the uh, people are the number one asset of the planet. And if I speak globally, I think we're doing a lousy job educating people and empowering people. Uh, few of us make it to college. If you are privileged enough to make the college, you can bear the financial burden. If you go outside this country, we are the, the, the envy of the world for education. If you grow up in Africa, there's just no chance to get the type of education you need over here. So one of the things that MOOCs will absolutely do is level that playing field, bring education to the 99% who can't get it right now. And to me, this is a better recipe for addressing the planet's problems than anything else I can imagine. An educated world. Thank you. Dedicated world that people learn to help themselves and leveling of the knowledge and skills based across different countries, I think will have a bigger impact than anything else. And of course, then, as they say, uh, you can you can feed a man for one night by catching them a fish, or you give him food for the rest of the life by teaching him how to fish. And I think we are in the teaching how to fish part right now. So this is a question. The next question is going a little bit different uh, direction and a little bit 
technical, so technical enough for me to read, right? But um, just ask, how did you go about developing the software slash iPad app for making the Udacity courses as demoed in your presentation? And what programming languages were used? And this is where I'm not sure what they're asking. Objective something? Uh, yes, Objective-C, that's what it says. Ah, yeah. oh, that's what it says. <laughs> 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 and, and I'm not a computer programmer. Is, is it available for purchase? Uh, not even available for purchase. We are still contemplating which way to, to, to push this. Um, we started the company. Um, it's actually proud of you for profit, as we say. I agree very much on this. Um, and we hired about 15 engineers. And they built a, um, a video play system, a course management system, a teacher portal, a student portal, um, tools for making these classes within about a year. Um, and it's an amazing achievement of the team. And that's Silicon Valley at its best. It's how innovation happens uh, in Silicon Valley, of course, which uh, you are the, basically a part of. Um, this objective C is being used in the iPad app. A lot of stuff is in uh, Python and other programming areas. I think we're teaching Python, isn't that right, Eric? Okay. Yeah, so so that answers one of the questions about how you're funded, and you can find that you're a, a for-profit. Um, and a, a piece of another question along those lines, uh, somebody is wondering, are Udacity and Khan Academy and other online um, uh, providers, if you will, collaborating? If so, or if not, why not? And is there sort of, you know, a MOOC group or MOOC conference? Um, yeah, there's uh, <coughs> no, first MOOC conference coming up, a MOOC workshop coming up. And Sal and I are close friends, we talk a lot, we have not yet shared software. And um, sharing of software is a little bit difficult because everyone's working like crazy on their own software and, and the last thing you want to do is like bring more people and integrate more and slow you down. Um, and I actually believe a, a bit of healthy competition is a good thing because it, it spurs innovation a lot. Um, that was on the, on the software, the second part? Um, the second one is, yeah, is there collaboration and it's the mm -hmm. One thing I did in December is I invited a couple of new MOOC pioneers um, to write a student bill of rights. And we, we published this in the Chronicle. And we asked ourselves the question, in the digital age, what rights should be unable rights for students to have? And we came up with things like financial transparency and pedagogical excellence. And everybody should be able to be a teacher, not just a student. And we wrote those out. Um, we got some flag for it. It wasn't very large in certain places. People critiqued us for being too white and uh, too old and all kinds of stuff. Not only the it was actually written, but then the second wave of journalism praised it and said it's good that somebody's speaking up for the student. Um, there's a, a, a strong commitment among the MOOC people to really focus on the student as an online uh, person to serve. And I'm not always convinced when I talk to uh, educational organizations and so on that the student's always the single most important person in the room because you're really not there. Um, but yeah, there's some cross-talk of course between the students. So speaking of the student, we have a, a, a kind of practical question. To get college credit, how are you determining that the named online student is actually took the quizzes and did the assessment? We, uh, um, we have proctor exams, and there's two proctor methods, one is in person, and there's something called virtual proctor, which is a nationally accepted standard, where you get in front of the computer, show your ID, being watched all the time and your screen is being watched all the time. Why is it not entirely cheap proof? This is what's being done um, for all kinds of government certificates and so on. So they're all proctored and the proctor rate is, is really important. And the last thing you want to do is a situation where students can easily cheat and then make up uh, credits. But it's, it's very accepted by everybody. Thanks. This is a, a sort of big picture question. How does knowledge long-term fundamental knowledge get protected in the future? And I think... Um, protected from who? I'm not sure, because I read this question. <laughs> I, I think maybe the person who wrote it is thinking about, um, uh, you know, we've got universities with very different missions, and some are, are really focused on research and so on, and perhaps that's if, what they're If you've learned one thing about society, you should not protect knowledge. We should dissent that knowledge. You should be radical about getting knowledge to everybody and skills to everybody without any IP concerns and any copyright. You just do it. I guess what I'm and asking that? about is quality control. Quality oh, quality control. control. Okay, thank okay. you. Good. Different question. Um, we, we right now are doing a study that the National Science Foundation funded on our specific classes to understand what the outcomes are relative to any classroom experience. 
and our objective is to be at least as good as, as, as in class. And the uh, dimensions of performance we look at is uh, student retention and student performance. Uh, and, uh, and, and really diving into this right now. There's been a lot of studies in the online space. Some conclude the online is much worse, some conclude it's even better. And it depends on the student group you choose, it depends on what online platform you use. There's many different types of, of, of systems. Um, certainly, I would critique that the present MOOCs have enormous dropout rates when they're free of charge. So I take issues with this myself. Um, what I would really love to see is a much more rigorous, quality focused educational field. Um, I actually um, commiserate the fact that uh, most of today's education is very lax in quality. Um, and we can dive into details and look at the specific courses, specific offerings. The variation of quality is enormous. And while us educators pay a lot of lip service to it, we as a system don't have a very consistent way to make sure the quality is there. And we tend not to measure it, to be honest. Right. We tend to not even rank colleges by how good they meet their educational mission. But the universities hold the, the sort of quality knowledge, like, you know, the best way to think about the calculus, or the best electrical engineering, you know. Well, the, the course, the, the quality uh, I was thinking about is in addition to the one you addressed is the sort of the quality of the, the content, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think you know, UC Berkeley has a great reputation in electrical engineering because they've kind of developed a culture there around what are the best thing, what are the best fundamentals to understand. You know, what is, what is the bedrock knowledge, right? And universities, you know, they hold the bedrock. And so, where does where's, where's the bedrock happen? You know, if it's not in teaching well, institutions. The, the good thing is, first of all, no one is saying on teaching institutions. And the opposite is the case. I mean, all the new providers work with teaching institutions for their reason. Um, when we open this up and make it measurable and transparent, quality will go up. Right? There's no question in my mind because we're going to put a lot of pressure on everybody. Like, if you put up the fifth electrical engineering 101 MOOC, you you can compare. There's been three computer science 101 MOOCs. The fourth one is coming out very soon. And people compare and, and look at this and, and assess it. Uh, they don't put a lot of uh, pressure on the instructors to make the quality better, with the potential benefit if you win the quality game that you might have 10 times as many students as anybody else. So I'm extremely upbeat on this. Um, I take no position who should be the best computer science professor. If you look at who writes the best textbooks in computer science, it's not always the most important researchers. If you go to the basic uh, textbooks, you find professors that call never heard about writing amazing textbooks because it's specialized on really high quality textbooks. And the same might happen here. Maybe the best uh, calculus class will come out of a, a college you never heard about. But there's a group of people who do a fantastic job uh, teaching calculus. And that is great. It's just wonderful. And who knows, maybe you see Berkeley at some of the uses calculus class because it's so good. They had it uh, for accounting. There's a person in Utah who's not being uh, used at leading business schools because this guy has an online class on accounting and is so insanely good that no one can compete anymore. And, and, and the colleges say, like, take this class and understand the counting. We can't beat this. Isn't this great? <laughs> and that's exactly what we want. Okay. I think uh, we all like to end on a few note, and we're out of time, so thank you very, very much. We really appreciate it.